Grove Legislative. Good afternoon, everyone. My name is Beirut Saad. Thank you for joining us this afternoon for the Work with USAID uh, webinar. Uh, my name is Feru Saad, Director of Public Engagement within the Bureau of Legislative and Public Affairs at USAID. I would now like to introduce our Deputy Assistant Administrator of LPA, Gabby Choker. Gabby? Everybody, so excited to be here with you today. USAID is committed to expanding our partners and holding events like this one is really important to move the pendulum in the right direction. You all have such valuable experiences that can improve work and how we help people around the world. So thank you for joining us today and helping USAID achieve this important goal. I wanted to spend a couple minutes Sharing a little bit about our agency, the U.S. Agency for International Development, often referred by our acronym USAID. We lead international development and humanitarian assistance for the U.S. government around the world, and we're considered uh, the world's leading development agency. We tackle the most pressing global challenges. We have more than 80 field offices, and our diverse global team works in more than 100 countries around the world, to save lives, reduce poverty, strengthen democratic governance, and help people progress beyond our foreign assistance. For example, we are leading the humanitarian response in Ukraine, and we also lead the global COVID response, helping countries be able to tackle the pandemic. We, lead, we led the response to the Haiti earthquake in August and helped countries after natural disasters around the world. We ensure that kids, especially girls, get to go to school. We help address famine, drought, and food insecurity. And we help democracies be built up and tackle corruption. Those are just a few of the examples of what we spend most of our days working on. As the president has made clear, there is no longer a division between domestic and foreign policy. We must always be asking the question of how our work helps our fellow Americans, especially with so many pressing issues like COVID and climate change that see no borders. So let's actually talk a little bit about what development assistance actually is. USAID aims to expand opportunities to, for people to pursue a life that is secure and where their basic needs are met. The opportunity to create, innovate, and learn. The opportunity to build a better future for one's family and community. We know that many of you can relate to that concept. It's easy sometimes to take for granted that here in the United States, we have things like clean water, electricity, access to food, the right to vote or freedom of religion or opinion, and that we have schools for our children and on. When it comes to humanitarian assistance and disaster relief, USAID aims to save lives, alleviate human suffering, and reduce economic and social impact of disasters. For instance, as I mentioned with the Haiti earthquake in August of 2021, we deployed a disaster assistance response team to lead the US government effort. We searched for survivors, we assessed needs, and we provided life-saving assistance from food, shelter, medications, and other services. In November of this past year, Administrator Samantha Power, our fearless leader, gave a new vision for global development speech at Georgetown University. During the speech, which coincided, coincided with USAID's 60th anniversary, so yes, we've been doing this for six decades and are very excited for our future, she outlined a bold, inclusive vision for the future of international development and our agency. Our team has taken the outside the box approach to create a storytelling and engagement to share our work and the purpose of USAID with new audiences. Our public engagement team led by Feirouz, who you saw at the beginning, has developed a new strategy that emphasizes engaging new audiences, such as diaspora, veterans, state and local stakeholders, while also expanding our relationships with existing stakeholders. I encourage all of you to remain connected to Feirouz and our team who can work with you to identify opportunities 
to work with us beyond what you will hear from just this briefing today. We at USAID tremendously value diversity, equity, inclusion, and accessibility, as we refer to it as DEIA. And it's a priority for us and a necessity that touches all the facets of our work. That means our diversity in our workforce, to our partners, and the type of work that we do. But we still have a significant way to go to meet our goals in this space. And helping to lead this charge and drive for the future of the agency is our next speaker. It is my great pleasure to introduce you to Deputy Administrator Coloma Adams Allen, who is responsible um, in the leadership of the agency to assist in the direction of where we are going as an agency, the future of international development, and focuses on budget, finance, management, institutional policy, and external relations. No small feat. She brings a wealth of experience actually back to USAID, where she previously served on the leadership team in our Latin America and Caribbean Bureau. We are grateful to have her as one of our fearless leaders at the agency. Thank you again for joining us today. We are so excited to explore new opportunities with all of you. And together, I really believe we can do some amazing work to help people around the world. Paloma, over to you. Thank you. Thanks so much, Gabby, for kicking us off. Good afternoon, everyone. Thanks to the entire engagement team um, for your dedication to our mission here at USAID. Um, I'd like to really thank all of you on this call today, especially those of you who may have just learned about USAID or learned a little bit from Gabby just now and have yet to partner with us. As Gabby noted, for 60 years, USAID has collaborated with U.S. and international organizations from across the public and private sectors, NGOs, civil society, and local actors, really seeking their expertise and engaging their networks to drive development progress in more than 100 countries around the world. Within our ranks here at USAID, we have agricultural, health, climate, and food scientists whose efforts save lives and improve livelihoods in the countries where we work. We have experts in engineering, economics, energy, trade, and innovation who help expand opportunity and build prosperity globally. And we have diplomats, scholars, advocates, and human rights defenders who protect and promote the democratic principles we hold dear. Since its founding, USAID has been an incredible force for good around the world, delivering life-saving humanitarian assistance, strengthening democratic institutions and civil society, and expanding access to vital medications, vaccinations, and treatments, while bol bolstering public health systems. And our partners, large and small, have been crucial to our positive impact over the decades. For example, our partnerships with small businesses provide our agency with outside expertise as they cultivate creative solutions to address some of the world's most sensitive issues. In Kenya, we're collaborating with Link, a US-based small business. As part of a collective that includes Kenyan and global organizations, LINK is engaging various stakeholders and spearheading collective actions, efforts aimed at two large uh, Kenyan companies to improve labor rights for people with disabilities and women in particular. We also partner with a number of American nonprofits that bring a sense of innovation and ingenuity and possess values directly aligned with our mission. For instance, since 2010, we have partnered with a Rhode Island-based organization called Edija that produces high nutrient ready to use foods that are distributed to children during humanitarian crises around the world. Over the past 12 years, our collaboration with them has helped provide healthy foods to some 16 million children in 60 countries. Not only do they have a massive impact in the fight against hunger, this organization recruits staff that is representative of the people they serve and our faith-based partners function as a gateway to communities everywhere. In Tanzania, for instance, local faith leaders are addressing the source of COVID-19 vaccine hesitancy in their communities, and faith-based organizations across denominations are distributing information toolkits that have significantly increased the uptake in vaccinations. We are proud of all of our accomplishments across six, six decades, but we also recognize that we and the countries and communities we serve would benefit from having a larger number of partners and new ideas, fresh perspectives, and expertise. One of the ways we're addressing this issue is through our commitment to being the agency for truly inclusive development. For us, inclusive development means 
partnering with organizations of all shapes and sizes and making good on our commitment to diversity, equity, inclusion, and accessibility, both within our walls and throughout our programming. So we're ramping up our engagement with organizations from different backgrounds and bringing more voices to the table to cement a diverse coalition of partners like all of you. We recognize that engagement is just the first step, however. We also have to address the aspects of our bureaucracy that are barriers to organizations seeking to work with us. Over the past year, we have taken steps to help organizations new to USAID navigate our partnership process. One of these steps has been the launch of our workwithusaid.org website, which serves as a one-stop shop that walk, walks organizations through the process of partnering with USAID. It includes online courses that assist in bidding for awards and other resources like connected, connecting prospective partners with existing partners. The website opens more doors for collaboration with organizations like yours, and we're excited to continue to remove obstacles that get in the way to close partnership with USAID. We have found that whether we're working with a small business, a nonprofit, a faith-based organization, or any of the groups represented here on the call today, you offer unique skill sets and bring different perspectives that allow us to better serve the communities we work with. I hope you'll consider partnering with us in the future. If you're interested in what we do, please do participate in the question and answer sessions, and please do go to workwithusaid.org to explore how you can get involved. USAID continues to strive to become the most inclusive agency and an agency committed to inclusive development. And we hope to find partners that reflect America's great diversity and seek to gain greater perspectives and innovations that you all bring. Thank you for joining us today. We hope to hear from you soon and we welcome you to the extended USAID family. Thanks everyone. Thank you so much, Deputy Administrator, for your remarks and for joining us here. Um, we're so excited to have you join us for this event. And um, uh, we're uh, glad to have had you. And um, you're you're welcome to stay, but we know you have a very busy schedule. And so um, love it for you to kind of go on with your day. And we can certainly take it from Thank you, everyone. Thank you. And thank you, Gabby, for, for opening us. Um, um, so uh, from here, we're going to move on to a presentation from our um, management bureau, um, Matt Johnson, who is the director of communications um, in our uh, management office of acquisitions. Um, we'll now be giving a presentation on work with USAID. You are welcome to continue to comment in the chat and put in questions there. I encourage you to wait until um, the end of the presentation, um, as I'm sure Matt will be answering a lot of the questions as he goes through. Matt, it's uh, it's all yours. Thank you, Feyruz, and thank you so much, uh, everyone, for joining us for um, today's webinar discussion. Really kind of the, the purpose of today's kind of presentation is really to give you some of the basic knowledge, the things and information you need to know uh, to be able to partner with USAID, such as how to find funding opportunities, how to understand what USAID is doing, really kind of understand us as an agency of how we operate. Um, I want to talk off, start a little bit talking about a little bit about the agency. I know Gabby uh, and our deputy administrator gave you a great kind of overview of intro. I want to highlight just a couple of more areas there. Um, I want to talk to you about sort of the partnering process. What does it look like to be a partner of USAID? Who do we partner with? Uh, we have a, a number of ways that we can get you connected after today's event, stay connected to our team, the work that we're doing. Uh, and then my colleague, Rachel, is going to just walk us through work with USAID.org, some of the resources that we have available on that website. Uh, and then we'd love to answer all the questions that you have uh, for today's webinar and event. So just a, a little bit about USAID. I know Gabby talked a little bit about our mission and the work that we do, uh, even some of the sectors that we work in and gave some great examples of that. Um, but you know, we as an agency have our own sort of operating framework and culture that it's important to know, to really be, understand uh, in, to, in order to be in a position to be able to partner with the agency. So I wanna start off by just kind of giving a, a very basic sort of like operating framework perspective for USAID. Uh, so we have something called the program cycle. It's really sort of how we do development as an agency. How do we design programs? How do we implement programs? How do we learn from them? How do we engage with the communities, countries that we're working in? So if you're kind of a development practitioner and you're really interested sort of what is USAID's model for doing development, you could take a look at our, our program cycle. But it really is sort of the tool that we use to guide of how we operate. 
um, and how our kind of development thought takes place within the agency. Kind of coming out of that, we then have a number of policies, strategies, frameworks, and visions. These policies, strategies, and frameworks are things that come out of our headquarters office that really look at we as an organization, how do we want to uh, promote gender equity and inclusion? How do we want to promote our water strategies? How do we want to promote locally led development? And so we as an agency have a number of sort of these broad policy strategies and frameworks that really help to guide the work that we do as an agency across some of the larger sectors or areas that we're interested that we work in. You know, for example, if you're an education organization, if you're focused on primary education or secondary education, you can learn more sort of how we do development, how our what our interventions look like uh, with regards to higher education or uh, basic education, water sanitation, gender equity inclusion. We have a number of different strategies, like I said, that guide uh, the work that we do. One of the, the most important documents I want to highlight is something called our country development cooperation strategies. You know, USAID isn't a, a foundation. We're not necessarily just a grant making organization. In every country and every dollar that we have, we're very intentional and strategic about how we spend it, uh, which then translates to the types of organizations and partners that we're looking for. So for every country that we operate in, we have what we call a country development cooperation strategy or CDCS uh, is the acronym you'll hear uh, in short. Uh, my colleague Rachel or somebody can post a link to all of our CDCS documents on USAID.gov. But these documents outline USAID's goals and objectives for the next three to five years in every country that we're operating in. And if you're looking to partner with USAID, what we're looking for is organizations that can help us meet the goals and strategies that are outlined in our CDCS documents. Uh, out of the CDCS documents, you know, we engage with local communities, um, our gov local governments that we're engaging in. We engage with uh, different uh, donor organizations, other countries, really to help to guide these strategies. And so they're really important, a really important framework for you to understand. So um, I see a number of folks on the chat box that are calling in from different places around the world. And so I'd encourage you to take a look at your sort of country specific CDCS policy for USAID really get an understanding of the types of programs and projects that USAID is undertaking in, in your particular country or area. Um, and the final thing, just sort of our operating framework is something called the ADS. It's really our internal operating policies and procedures. Um, if you really wanna dive into the details and weeds of how USAID operates, you can take a look at our ADS policies. Um, but if you're new to USAID, don't worry about it. Just basically, basically wanna highlight that as something that's really important for you to know and understand. Um, the other thing I want to highlight is just sort of how we fund our work. As I mentioned, you know, we as an organization, we are not a, a foundation. We can't just kind of give out money to anyone to have a great idea. Sometimes I wish we could do that. But um, all of our funding is done strategically and kind of flows through a process which we've outlined here. The USAID is a U.S. government agency, which means all of our funding comes from American people. It comes from Americans' tax dollars. And we get an annual budget every year from our Congress and executive office to really determine what is our budget? What are our priorities moving forward? So Congress sets our funding levels every year. Within those funding levels, there are oftentimes um, uh, guidance of things that Congress wants us to do, such as working in uh, HIV AIDS programs or uh, specific programs or activities, but there are oftentimes a lot of uh, guidance of how Congress wants us to spend our money each year. But oftentimes all of this really gets communicated and translated out, as I mentioned, in our country development cooperation strategies. And so those CDCS documents really try and take uh, the different types of funding, the priorities that we have, as well as the funding levels that we get from Congress, and what does it mean for a particular country that we're working in. Out of those CDCS documents and organizations, we develop programs and activities, and then organizations compete for that funding to implement those activities and programs. Uh, and so you just give you a you know, very quick snapshot of sort of how we fund our work. Um, what does that look like? Just to give you, a, you know, even a better breakdown of our funding and what it looks like, um, you can see here a breakdown of our funding last year for our programs and the different types of sectors and areas that we worked in. Obviously, health is a very large part of our portfolio. Uh, as a deputy administrator, and Gabby highlighted, uh, USAID has been leading the U.S. government's efforts to respond to COVID-19 around the world. So you see a large amount of funding in health. Uh, you also see a large amount of funding in our humanitarian assistance programs that we respond in places like Haiti and Ethiopia and Ukraine. Uh, but then it gives you a breakdown of some of the other sectors and areas that we're working. 
Um, but I do want to note, you know, if you're a water organization, for example, you know, water is something that fits into our humanitarian portfolio, can fit into our health portfolio, can fit into agriculture, economic growth. There's oftentimes a lot of overlap. So this isn't a fully representative of all the different types of sectors or areas that we work in. But just to give you a sense of about, you know, how much our funding, uh, how our funding is broken down each year by different sectors. So I want to shift now a little bit more to kind of the partnership process. You know, as Gabby highlighted and the Deputy Administrator highlighted, we as an organization are committed to diversity, equity, inclusion, and accessibility. And a key piece of that is how we partner and who we partner with. Uh, I am the agency's industry liaison, and my team, really our role of our team is to serve as a front door to the agency uh, for organizations that are interested in partnering and connecting with, with USAID. Uh, and one of the things that I love about the agency is that each year we partner with more than 3,500 organizations around the world. Whether you're a diaspora group, a faith-based group, a U.S. business, a small business, uh, any type of organization you can imagine, we have a partnership with uh, a group like yours. Uh, and so if you're on the webinar today wondering, you know, does USAD work with a group like mine? The answer is more than likely yes. We have a very diverse set of organizations that we work with every year. But we're always looking to expand that, always looking to, to find new organizations that we can partner with uh, each year. So as I highlighted earlier, you know, we have a process by which all of our funding is sort of um, competitively done coming out of our country development cooperation strategies. Ultimately, this kind of comes down to kind of three key ways that we partner with organizations through a grant, a contract, or a cooperative agreement. I'm happy to explain a little bit the difference between the three of these. So a contract is USAID purchasing goods or services uh, to do work uh, overseas or do work around the world. It could be um, purchasing food aid supplies. It could be purchasing um, services to implement a program or activity. Um, this is done through a contract. And typically under a contract, organizations are allowed to receive profit for the work that they're doing. So if you are a for-profit business, you typically work with USAID under an acquisition or a contract uh, type mechanism. All of the agency's contracts are posted on SAM.gov. Uh, it's a U.S. government-wide site, but you can find every contract opportunity within the agency on this website. We have a um, policy within USAID and other places that every contract over $150,000 has to be posted on SAM.gov. So it's the most reliable and accurate place to go to find contract opportunities. The second way we work with organizations is through grants or cooperative agreements. Uh, under a, uh, the kind of term for both grants and cooperative agreements is assistance, meaning we provide financial support to an organization to help carry out a, an activity. Uh, under an assistance award, organizations are not allowed to receive profit for the work that they're doing. So typically, it's uh, not-for-profit organizations that are working with USAID through a grant or a cooperative agreement. A grant, as you can imagine, is USAID giving you money to implement an activity. We have very limited control, uh, and limited input in how you implement the program or activity. And a cooperative agreement is sort of somewhere between a grant and a contract where we give you money to implement an activity, provide financial support, but we're going to have a substantial level of um, input and control into how the program is done or how the, the activity is done. When you look at our funding at a whole as in, in any given year, about 20% 20 20 of our funding to 30% of our funding is issued as a, a contract. Around 40% or so of our funding is given as grants, uh, and the re remainder portion, about 30% or so, is given to cooperative agreements. So all of our grants and cooperative agreements are posted on the website grants.gov. Uh, you can go on SAM.gov and grants.gov today and find probably 20 or 30 kind of current open funding opportunities for USAID around the world. One of the things that I do want to note, though, is both SAM.gov and grants.gov are not USAID-owned systems. These are government-wide, U.S. government-wide systems. Uh, and so you'll find every other federal government agency on there. Uh, the websites can be a bit challenging, complicated to navigate, so we actually have a couple helpful tutorial videos uh, on our YouTube page, which my colleague Rachel can drop into the chat box. Really kind of walks you through how to find funding opportunities on grants.gov as well as funding opportunities on SAM.gov. Uh, and so, you know, from a very basic uh, perspective, like I said, almost all of our funding is issued through a grant, contract, or a cooperative agreement at the agency for organizations we're looking to partner with. But before something even uh, gets posted on SAM.gov or grants.gov, one of the, the best tools that we have for the agency is something called a business forecast. The forecast highlights all of our upcoming funding opportunities. So if you're looking at things from a kind of a linear perspective, 
You have our country development cooperation strategies, outlines our goals and objectives. Those then turn into specific programs or activities that USAID is planning on implementing. Those programs that we're planning on implementing get posted on our business forecast. And then once funding, once we're actually looking for partners with an organization, they get posted on SAM.gov or grants.gov. But our business forecast is updated daily, pulling from our internal planning system. I know when I looked at it yesterday, I think we had about 250 new funding opportunities that we are planning on implementing or looking for partners for within the next year on the website. Uh, and so the forecast is updated daily and has a host of information available to you as an organization. So I've highlighted on the screen here just one example of an activity on our business forecast. You can find that this activity is taking place in Colombia. We've got a point of contact at the agency. Uh, we have the estimated dollar amount of the activity around $25 million, um, anticipating when we're going to release a solicitation, whether it's going to be a contract or cooperative agreement. Uh, but there's a host of information that's available on our business forecast. And like I said, it's updated daily. So really encourage you to take a look at uh, the forecast. You can see the URL at the bottom, usad.gov slash business dash forecast. If you're interested, we'll share a link uh, in a bit about our email distribution list, but we also do a quarterly engagement around our business forecast. Where if you have any questions about upcoming funding opportunities, we invite you to submit those questions to us and we answer all those questions. We just did a business forecast call a couple of weeks ago, and I think we answered around seven or 800 questions related to upcoming funding opportunities, which is available on our business forecast website if you're interested in taking a look at it. But really the business forecast is an important tool for you. We, we try and signal everything that we are planning on doing before we're even looking for partners. So check out the biz, business forecast today. Um, one of the, the frequently asked questions that we get um, when organizations are coming to us, you know, do I need to be registered somewhere to work with USAID? So we don't have our own kind of pre uh, kind of pre-approved vendor system or registration system that exists at USAID, uh, but we are basic um, registration requirements to get funding from the U.S. government. Uh, these, system, these requirements actually just changed this past Monday uh, on April 4th, and so this is a bit new information. But there's only two systems you have to be registered in. One is SAM, the, the website I highlighted earlier, SAM.gov. Uh, if you're an organization that's interested in applying for U.S. government funding. You have to have what's called a unique identity ID number. It's a 12 character number that gets assigned to your organization. Uh, it's a free system to register in. You don't have to do anything to get registered. You don't have to pay you anything to get registered in the system, um, but it's a free system that you can go in, register your organization, and get you, uh, basically allows your organization to be eligible to apply for funding. The second piece of registration is you have to have a cage or in cage code. Uh, these are other free registration systems. If you're a non-U.S. organization, you have to be have an NCAGE number, or if you're based in the U.S., you have to have a CAGE number. Um, once again, these are U.S. government-wide systems. They are a bit complex to use, but we have on our website, workwithusaid.org, we actually have a training module that walks you through step-by-step -step how to register in all of these systems. We also have a, a great video on our YouTube channel called Registration Expectation uh, that really helps you get prepared to even begin registering for them because uh, it takes a little bit of time. But all that to say, if you're interested in applying for funding, I encourage you to take a look at both SAM and the CAGE and NCAGE um, uh, websites and begin getting registered on them. Uh, that'll make you in a, put your organization in a position to be eligible to apply for funding. Um, and before I get into a couple other funding opportunities, I do want to just provide a, a little bit of information or some tips for submitting a proposal or application to USAID. So under a contract, we'll issue what's called a request for proposals, where we invite organizations to submit proposals to us, uh, to USAID. In an RFP, or the acronym as we call it, a request for proposal, there'll be very specific instructions about what USAID is looking to do, what we're looking for, and how we're going to evaluate organizations. So it's really important that if you're looking at a, an application or a proposal that's on, or responding to a request for proposal that's on SAM.gov, that you read the entire solicitation carefully. All of the ideas and input of what USAID is looking for, even how you're going to be evaluated, are within that solicitation. If there's something that doesn't make sense to you, I encourage you to ask a question to the point of contact that's listed in that application or proposal. So for almost every funding opportunity we have, there is an open period, typically the first week to two weeks of a funding opportunity, where we allow organizations to submit questions to us, and then we post answers to all of those questions uh, with with the, the solicitation. So it's really important to ask questions, don't make assumptions about what USAID is looking to do. 
Then third, you know, follow the instructions outlined in the solicitation. I know this is a, a very basic thing, but as we've reviewed, as I've reviewed proposals throughout the years, um, this is one of the most common things that we see organizations uh, messing up on. You know, we have very specific instructions in a solicitation to really try and create a level playing field so we can fairly evaluate every concept note, proposal, or application that comes to USAID. If organizations aren't following instructions, unfortunately, we have to throw out the application uh, without even giving a chance for organization to follow up. So it's really important to follow the instructions that are outlined in the solicitation in order for us to create kind of a, a level playing field. And you might be asking sort of, you know, how do I demonstrate or how do I kind of prove to USAID that I'm a good organization? There's a couple of things that we're, you know, always looking for with that. One, what is your technical expertise? Two, what's your past performance? And really, how can you demonstrate your ability to accomplish sort of the work into the future? Um, what that, and those are kind of some of the three key areas that we're really looking for organizations to demonstrate to us. So, you know, show it, tell us of how you've done this work before in the past, or tell us why you have this idea and how you think you can implement it, how you can make it happen. You know, give us some level of certainty that you have the ability to actually accomplish the work uh, in the activity. So it's really important to demonstrate that to USAID uh, in your proposal. And then, you know, finally, two quick things, you know, just be specific, don't let USAID make assumptions. Be specific about your experience, be specific about how you would accomplish the work, be specific about, you know, really your past performance and experience uh, as an organization or individuals as you're submitting a proposal. And then finally, I would consider uh, partnering with an organization that has experience working with USAID. You know, it is a process to apply for funding for the agency and there's organizations, like I said, about 3,500 organizations around the world that do work with us currently that have experience that have gone through that process and been successful. There are all sorts of partnership arrangements that often take place when organizations come to USAID and it's a great way to kind of get your foot into the door. And the other thing I'll note just before moving on from this slide, you know, if you're new to USAID and you're looking at the process for submitting an application or proposal, I would encourage you just to go through the process of doing it. It's a learning experience. You learn by submitting an application, you learn by submitting a proposal, you learn kind of a little bit about the agency. You know, even if your application or proposal is rejected, one of the things that we can do is we can brief you after we've had a chance to review your application or proposal, give you feedback, give you specific guidance about, hey, if you're going to apply again, here's some areas that you can improve uh, your um, application to USAID. Because of the procurement laws and procure, uh, rules, we can't do it sort of before a proposal or application is submitted, but after you've submitted an application, uh, we can have those conversations with you. And so encourage you just to consider, you know, step taking a, a leap of faith, putting a proposal application out there, and then engaging with USAID as a part of that process. There's a couple other programs I want to kind of highlight, mention to you spe uh, specifically if you're new to USAID. These are four really great programs that are kind of targeted and geared towards newer organizations. So the first is the Development Innovation Ventures of the DIV program. That's really looking at innovative programs that we can take and scale for maybe a very small program that we can scale across multiple countries. Uh, and so the DIV program is a great program if you're new to USAID and you have a really innovative idea that maybe you haven't had a chance to fully test out, uh, but the DIV is a great program. There's levels of funding kind of starting around $100,000 going up to you know $500,000, I think potentially all the way up to $15 million to scale an idea. The second is the new partnerships initiative, which many of you have heard us talk about. Uh, but really the goal of the new partnerships initiative is trying to lower barriers for organizations. And so we have specific funding opportunities set up for new organizations to partner with USAID. Uh, if you're a private sector partner, you work in the private sector, we have a great program called the Global Development Alliance that's really set up to create partnerships opportunities with the private sector to help USAID to solve, solve problems. And so you can check out our Global Development Alliance. And then finally is our American Schools and Hospital Abroads program, which provides assistance to overseas schools, libraries, and hospital centers. Uh, and so if you're working in a school, library, or hospital center, it's a great program um, to get uh, working with. And so the American Schools and Hospital Broads program, the Global Development Alliance, as well as the, DIV, the Development Innovation Ventures or DIV program, actually has a year-long solicitation where uh, we, submit, we receive application proposals kind of throughout the year. Um, and so you can go to the websites that I've highlighted here on this web page uh, and take a look at those programs in a bit more detail. Um, before I switch off to a couple other things, I do want to talk a little bit about USAID and U.S. small businesses. If you're a U.S. small business, we have an amazing small business office that 
I would encourage you to connect with. Their email address is osdbu, O-S-D-B-U-1, at usaid.gov. Uh, but our small business office, one of the, the great things they do is they actually review every contract coming out of the agency from Washington, D.C., over $250,000. Uh, to determine if there are any U.S. small businesses that are in a position and capable to actually meet those requirements. Uh, and so connecting with our small business office, making yourself aware of who they are is a great place, a uh, great place to get started at the agency. They love to meet with new small businesses. Uh, our small business office, office also does a lot of training for um, USAD staff of how to work with uh, small businesses, and they also host a number of events throughout the year uh, to get you connected to the agency. Like I said, if you are a U.S. small business, please reach out to our small business office. They're an amazing group of people that would love to connect with you. Um, and finally, just uh, two more quick things. So we did launch a new website, workwithusad.org. My colleague, Rachel, is gonna highlight it in a second. Uh, it's really is an amazing tool to help you identify and kind of get in ready in a position to be able to partner with USAD. We're updating the website weekly, providing new content and stories and information for you to get connected with us uh, as an agency. Then finally, you know, I just want to highlight a, a couple of ways to stay connected to our team. So um, our team, uh, the industry liaison team, does a ton of outreach events. Uh, we host uh, Twitter, Twitter sessions. We have a LinkedIn group. Uh, we have a Facebook group. But we're kind of always posting and highlighting new funding opportunities, new events, new ways to get engaged. You can join our email distribution list. You can follow us on social media, uh, as well as um, you connect with us on workwithusaid.org. Um, and so we really want to say to you, like, our door is open. We want, to, we want to meet you. We want to hear from you. You can contact me and my team at industryliaison at usad.gov. It's just an email address that goes to the three of us on my team. Uh, we'd be happy to, to set up a time to talk with you and your organization. Uh, we'd also be happy to, to share with you additional resources. And I think as a follow-up to this event, we will be emailing out this slide deck and all the links that we provided to everyone um, after the event. So. With that, I wanna um, stop sharing and turn it over to my colleague, Rachel Chilton. Rachel is our um, Deputy Industry Liaison. She's gonna talk to you a little bit about workwithusaid.org, some of the tools and resources we have available on that site uh, to help you get connected to the agency. So Rachel, over to you. Great, thank you so much. Um, I was just quickly and furiously typing all of the links um, for things you were talking about into the chat. So I hope people were able to get them. And as Matt said, um, after the event, we will be sure to send an email that includes all of the links that I've dropped in the chat, just so you have them all in one place, in addition to a, a link to the video recording and the PowerPoint. So you will have all of the, the resources in your, your email box later. So don't worry if you miss something. Um, I know we only have about 20 minutes left, so I just wanted to really quickly give an overview of our new website that our deputy administrator mentioned um, it is called workwithusaid.org. So this website was launched in November of uh, this past year um, with new and, and prospective partners in mind, in addition to our current partners, as well as USAID staff. Um, so this is what our homepage looks like, and we would really encourage you to take time to visit this website. I just wanna first point out in the bottom left corner, a little plugin we have called Accessibi. Um, so if you need to change the way the font looks on the screen or adjust the font size or, you know, different colors of the website, things like that, you can click the accessibility um, icon in the bottom corner. We want to make sure this website is as accessible as possible for everyone. Um, so we will get started. Uh, the tagline here on the homepage is new to USAID, start here. So we would recommend that people click the learn more button here um, and that'll take you to this page that has a checklist um, for you to walk through to see if your organization is ready to work with USAID um, and you can click and expand uh, each answer here each little check box you should read through you know is my organization eligible to work with USAID how do I prepare? Where can I find out about funding opportunities? And it will link you to a number of things that Matt already covered during his presentation. Um, so this is a really handy checklist that we would recommend you start with. You can also download the checklist and take it with you. Um, so if you click on view language options, we do have it in a number of languages. We are continuing to work with our staff around the world to have it translated into 
even more languages. So you'll see we have Arabic, Burmese, we have English, uh, Portuguese, Spanish, Ukrainian, and Vietnamese at the moment. Um, we're working to get French up there soon in addition to a number of other languages. So you can click English and then click your paper format size and then it'll let you download it so you can save it on your computer and walk through and tick off all the different check boxes as you uh, go through that checklist. So, so that's a really great place to, to start on the website. Um, and I'll really quickly walk through a few other key website features before we go to all of our q and I know we had a number of questions rolling in, so we'll make sure to get to those. Um, I'd really like to first highlight our partner directory. Um, so if you click on find a partner and search the directory, you'll see that we have a number of uh, ways for you to search and filter. So for instance, we have different sectors here. Um, if I click on agriculture and food security, um, you can search by country here. You know, I had the chance to work in Tanzania for a while, so I'll click on Tanzania. And then if I, if I click search, um, these are all of the organizations that are currently working in Tanzania um, that are listed in our partner directory. And you can see there are quite a few. Um, I also just wanna point out that there are more filter options. So if you click on more filter options, we also have types of organizations. So you'll see you know, an NGO, small business, a diaspora group, things like that you can sort by. We also have a USA partnership option. So if an organization is already a prime contractor or a subcontractor or hasn't had the opportunity to partner with us yet. Um, and we also have different socioeconomic factors. So if it's a woman owned business, minority owned, things like that, um, there are a number of other ways you can filter through our partner directory. I'll really quickly just look at uh, an example profile. So this is a profile for a company in or organ a non-government organization in Zanzibar, a beautiful place. Um, and you'll see this is what the, the profile looks like. There's an about us section where you can list that. Um, you can list what country you're based in, what country you operate in, um, all the different socioeconomic factors, the different technical sectors in which you work. Um, and I'll show you another example here. You can also link all of your social media buttons. This is another example. And also if you know an, a company or organization works in a number of, of different countries, you'll see all the different countries in which they operate in. So this is a great place uh, to search for other organizations for possible sub partnership opportunities. Um, it's also a great place for USAID staff to be able to do market research. We already have staff in a number of countries who have asked um, for us to share a list with them of organizations working in their country. So we would highly encourage you to take time to um, register your organization in our partner directory if you have not done so yet. Um, it's fairly easy to do. It, it takes a few minutes to, to walk through to add your, your profile photo, your name, and um, your little blurb and stuff like that. So I think we have about 2,000 profiles at the moment. We have quite a few. Um, so we would recommend you take time to do that if you have not yet. Um, next, I'd like to talk about our pre-engagement assessment. So if you haven't worked with USAID before and not sure if um, your organization is eligible or ready, we have set up a pre-engagement assessment that is 48 questions, um, self-assessment where you walk through, and I just, give me one second. Um, I logged in, let's see. Sorry about that, I already have a profile, so it's going to say I already took the assessment. Um, but this is what'll, what it will look like when you uh, set up a profile to walk through it. So there, again, there are 48 questions and they cover things like programming, compliance, human resources, program management, and budget and finance. And um, you can click through and save and continue. You can also save and continue it later um, if you can't continue it all at once. Um, again, this is you know a self-paced uh, assessment that will help you identify potential capacity gaps that your organization might have 
in any one of these different uh, topic areas to be able to compete for USAID funding. Um, and once you go through the whole assessment, you will receive, if it lets me go to it, uh, a customizable report. So you can see I have a, a test version here. I did a USAID uh, test. So once you finish your report, you will uh, your test, your assessment, you will get a customizable report here that will walk through, you know, how you did in the different topic areas. Um, and it will walk you through all the key findings, um, how your organization is set up for programming, human resources, things like that. And then it'll point you to all of the different tools and resources in our library um, that you can go to to learn more to build your capacity. So um, we would highly recommend you, you do this if you haven't had a chance yet. This will help you um, assess your organizational health and readiness to be able to compete for USAID funding. You know, we've heard in the past that sometimes organizations apply for solicitation opportunities and, and don't really hear back as to why um, they were not selected. So this might be, you know, an indicator of, of something that you have maybe not set up yet um, to be able to compete in the first place. And it's important to note that this is completely confidential. This will not be shared with anyone outside of your organization. It will not be shared with USAID. Um, it also will not impact, you know, whether or not you can receive funding from USAID. This is just a, a self-assessment to help you um, evaluate where your organization is. So we would encourage you to take our pre-engagement assessment if you have not had a chance to do so. Um, next, I'll really quickly talk about our library. We have a library um, with a number of different resources, and you can filter by different categories on the left side. So if you're interested in co-creation, you'll see we have an, a number of items here. We have, you know, an assessment, and um, this only takes five minutes to read. We have a video here that only takes two minutes. But then you'll see we have a webinar that takes 180 minutes, so it's really nice to have um, you know, that time kind of gauged there so you can plan your day if you want to look through a number of different resources we have on our website. Um, you can also filter by different content if you want to read a guide versus, you know, watch a video. We, we understand that people learn things in a different way. Um, and I'll also just quickly point out that if you click this little ribbon next to a resource, it'll save it to your own resources in your profile. So when you go back to the library, you can click on my resources and you can see these are all the resources that I have saved in my own little resource library and that I will not have to, you know, go back and search through the whole library again, um, especially if you had to pause and you wanna go back to, to look at something. Um, so that's just another feature I wanted to point out and I feel like we are running out of time. Um, sorry, I'm trying not to talk too quickly. So we also have our news and insights blog. Um, we just posted a blog, I think yesterday, yesterday, the day before, I don't know what day it is anymore, um, that has our April events. So we have a number of other events coming up linked here. Um, we'll be hosting a Twitter space uh, at the end of the month if you're interested and speaking with our US-based uh, small business office director. Um, it also has a number of funding opportunities linked to uh, SAM.gov and grants.gov. Um, so we're going to start to do that each month there. Um, but this is a, a place to also highlight, you know, success stories, um, partnership success stories, getting through the partnership process and what that looked like if it was through co-creation or some other method. Um, we also, you know, highlight articles with a number of tips and resources on how to navigate different parts of the partnership process. Uh, we just had a, a photo contest that we did recently. So um, we would recommend that you take time to look through our News and Insights blog. Um, we recently added a new funding tab at the top uh, that will take you directly to our business forecast. And we understand that SAM.gov and grants.gov are a little difficult to navigate at times. So if you click on either of these links, 
it'll bring you to um, like a pre-populated version of SAM.gov that has already filtered for USAID uh, opportunities specifically, and same with grants.gov for our assistance opportunities. So I wanted to point that out. And then finally, we have our frequently asked questions section. I believe we have almost a thousand questions um, answered in our FAQ. So almost a thousand of the most frequently asked questions about how to partner with USAID. Um, again, this is kind of an expandable, contractable uh, setup here. If you wanna learn more about grants under contracts, we have a lot of information there. Uh, blanket purchase agreements, um, you know, we have a USAID fundamental section that'll walk you through things like the business forecast that Matt talked about earlier. And you can also go into our search box um, if you have a, a specific topic you'd like to search for. It'll bring up all of the Q&A on that specific topic. And then I will stop talking in just a minute. We also have a little chat bot in the, the corner here. You'll see if you click on it, it will Note if you've already completed things, like I've completed the assessment, but I haven't created a profile in the partner directory yet because I don't have an organization. Um, but it'll take you to that. It'll also take you to a menu. It's not like a live person, but it's it's more just to help you navigate the website. So that's another feature we have there. Um, and with that, I think we're ready for question and answer. I'm sorry, I know that was a lot of information. And I probably talked too quickly, but I will hand it over to Gary. Thank you. Thanks, Rachel. Um, there's a lot of information, but from what I can see from the question and answer, hopefully, a lot of questions. Um, to answer some questions at the top, people are asking about getting the resources um, that have been shared here. We will make sure to follow up with all attendees and sharing PowerPoint presentations, as well as information about some of your upcoming events. That sounds like could potentially answer some of these other questions coming in about some of the more technical pieces. So we'll make sure to share as much information with everyone after this as possible. Um, so let me start off um, with a very simple, but I think very important question for, for the group we have on the line. Um, how does USAID partner with small businesses? You may wanna remind them about your upcoming Twitter space chat as well. Yeah, happy to take that one. So we do a lot of work with small businesses uh, around the world. So we have a great cadre of small businesses that work with us. And as an agency, we actually have goals that we have to report to Congress and to other executive leaders on the work that we do with small businesses every year. So like I said earlier, we have an amazing team, a small business team that's really just focused on working with U.S. small businesses uh, in our work. You can connect with them at osdebu1 at usad.gov. I'll drop their link in or drop their email address into the chat box just so everyone's got it. Uh, but for most, you know, small businesses, they're interested in working with us um, on for contracts, uh, different contracts that we have. Um, interesting, if you go on our business forecast, you can take a look at our business forecast. You can actually see funding opportunities that are specifically set aside for U.S. small businesses and uh, the work that we're doing. So. Part of what we do if you're a small business, we review every contract or our small business office reviews every contract that's issued out of Washington, D.C. and does market research to really try and connect U.S. small businesses with uh, USAID funding opportunities. And so for everything that we do, there's a level of market research where we're trying to identify potential organizations. Uh, and so for our small business office community, we have uh, ways to actually restrict competition so we can just set aside programs for small businesses. Um, so for small businesses, like I said, I'd first, you know, connect with our, our small business office, which is the Office of Small Disadvantaged Business Utilization, or OSDEBU for short. At USAID, we love acronyms, but OSDEBU is the office. Um, connect with them. You can add your information to our partner directory. And then, like I said, take a look at our business forecast uh, and look for opportunities that are specifically set aside for small businesses. Thank you, Matt. Um, so I'm going to just combine some questions and, and maybe ask a couple and you to help with time. So a question came in about um, experience and size of businesses and organizations. Um, so if the um, if an organization hasn't worked with USAID in the past and therefore doesn't have an experience, 
um, which seems to be important in this process, um, how, what are pathways that maybe can exist for them to be considered? Um, how can they partner? Obviously, we just went over that a little. And then, um, and then one more related to size, um, is there any support for grassroots organizations that don't necessarily have the capacity to write a competitive proposal, but are capable to deliver? Yeah, those are really good questions. So um, I think a couple of things I would say, you know, looking at the size of the programs, I've seen programs at USAID as small as like $90,000 supporting, you know, um, groups in Iraq uh, up to $10 billion <laughs> over 10 years. So the size and scale of awards are going to vary greatly. So, you know, certainly if you're new and you don't have some of the capacity and, and even the requirements that USAID is going to ask of organizations, are going to be more complex sort of the larger uh, the activity is. One of the reasons I wanted to I highlighted earlier um, for specific programs, the ASHA program, our DIV program, the New Partnerships Initiative, and our Global Development Alliance or GDA um, program is that those four programs actually have a much simpler process to applying for funding. So, for example, with the New Partnerships Initiative, Rather than requiring these complex uh, proposals that are 40, 50 pages long, all we're asking for is organizations to submit two to five page concept notes. Uh, and so one of the things that we're trying to do, I should have mentioned this earlier, really trying to make it easier to work with us is that we're moving away from a lot of the larger requests for applications or proposals and really trying to simplify the process of really just asking for more simple concept notes one of the other things that we often do or we're trying to do more of is something called oral presentation. So rather than actually presenting a concept note to USAID, we just invite you into a meeting with us and you have like an hour to give us a presentation or pitch on the work that we're doing. Um, so as you go through and look at different funding opportunities or different mechanisms, there's other there's some ways that are a little bit easier to partner with USAID. Um, and so I would definitely take a look at those. So look for funding opportunities that say the new partnerships initiative um, look at the, the DIV program, look at the ASHA program, and then look at things that are just asking for a concept note. Those will, like I said, those will typically be smaller um, amounts of funding, um, but they are great ways to get your foot in the door with USAID. Okay, I'm going to try and couple one last question with maybe three. Um, so a few questions about submitting proposals. Um, and whether USAID accepts unsolicited proposals, um, if there's a process for receiving feedback after submitting proposals, and um, if it's possible to see um, completed sample proposals for reference. So I'll start with the last question. So on sample proposals, so um, unfortunately the answer is no. You know, if you submit a proposal to us, that is your, um, confidential information. We don't share anyone's proposal with anyone else. Um, that is your proprietary information and knowledge. And so unfortunately, we can't share anyone else's proposal with you. But, you know, if you connect with other organizations that have partnered with USAID, they can potentially help you walk through that process. Um, um, so I would take a look at that. USAID does accept unsolicited proposals. Um, I would say that the barrier to getting an unsolicited proposal is extremely challenging. You know, we're looking for something that's totally innovative that no one else can do. And at the end of the day, there's honestly very limited funding for unsolicited proposals. There is one program that's set up, I'm gonna drop the link into the chat box, which is our um, unsolicited solutions for locally led development program. This specific program is set up and has a pot of funding each year for unsolicited proposals that really promote local um, development activities. And so if you're looking at unsolicited proposals, I would definitely take a look at that um, that specific uh, opportunity that you'll see there. It has instructions and guidance on it. Uh, and then we can drop a link into the chat box. We also have available on our website broader guidance. If you are interested in pursuing the unsolicited proposal route, um, you can take a look at that. One of the things I'll just say with unsolicited proposals, we get a lot of those. Uh, and so it's sometimes challenging for us to respond back quickly to all of them and give substantial feedback to it, to those. Uh, and so you may not get as much feedback as you would want through an unsolicited proposal. However, if you submit a concept note or proposal to a specific USAID funding opportunity, where typically there's fewer uh, opportunities and there's time built in to give feedback. And so 
um, we try and include feedback in our kind of more formal process, um, less so in the unsolicited proposal process. And I think that was all the questions, Fayrouz. Yes, if you don't mind, if I can add one that I missed. A question if proposals are accepted in any other language besides English. Yep, so right now, um, we only accept them in English. We are working on translating solicitations and information into other languages, because we know that's a huge barrier. Um, right now, the way USAID's laws and regulations are written by Congress, it only is allowed in English. Um, we are considering and looking at discussing with Congress about um, finding ways of actually submitting, getting proposals in other languages. But for right now, um, it is just in English. Thank you, Matt. And it's 3.30, so I want to be respectful of your time and everyone else's. Um, th there's a lot of technical questions about SAM.gov and Gage and Dunn's mm -hmm. numbers. Is there anywhere where we can refer people to, to help answer some of these specific questions? Yep, so you can email me and my team, You can Rachel and I, and it goes to one other colleague at industry liaison at USAD.gov. I think Rachel just dropped them in the chat box. We can help answer some of those questions. Um, so as of Monday, no one has to have a DUNS number. I saw a couple of questions related to DUNS, which is an old registration system that actually changed as of Monday. And so it's actually a much simpler process now. It's just registering in SAM and then CAGE or in CAGE. Um, but if you email us at industry liaison, we can help troubleshoot some of those questions to the best extent possible. Um, and I know somebody else asked about the link to unsolicited proposals, and I'll drop that into the chat box as well. Thank you. Well, thank you. We're, we're just over time. Like I said, I want to be respectful of, of everyone's time this afternoon. Um, this, this will definitely not be the last one that the Office of Public Engagement hosts. And I, and I know Matt and his team has done lots and lots of these. And so we will make sure to communicate with you all afterwards, share resources that have been shared here today. Um, and there's been a lot of contact information shared during this call as well. Also, when you received the invite in it was um, a link to sign up for um, USAID and Public Engagement Future Correspondence. So please feel free to go in there and connect with us. You can also reach the public engagement team at um, publicengagement at USAID.gov. Um, so thank you again for everyone's time. Thank you to our speakers, Matt and Rachel. Thank you for joining us and providing this community with such critical information. Um, and as promised, we will continue to be in touch. Thanks, everyone. Thank you. Thank you.